Issel's success led him to continue his efforts. Egyptologists had long been fascinated by the hieroglyphs that were surrounded by ovals. Called cartouches, they seemed to be placed strategically in and around the temples and tombs. A few Egyptologists had begun to speculate that a cartouche contained the name of a pharaoh or member of the royal family. Young used this knowledge to work on the theory that the cartouches on the Rosetta Stone would contain the name Ptolemy. The tablet was honoring him, so his name should be in the cartouches in the hieroglyphic section. Young further surmised that because Ptolemy was a Greek name, the Egyptians would have to write his name phonetically. If the hieroglyphs were pictorial, they would not contain symbols for foreign names or words. Four years after he began, Young correctly matched the Greek letters in the name Ptolemy with the hieroglyphs inside one of the cartouches. In 1818, he was the first one to cause the stone to speak. The hieroglyphic section had spoken its first word, Ptolemy. While his success was beginning to garner the public's attention across the English Channel in France, another man had already been obsessed with the deciphering of the Rosetta Stone. A man Young would initially encourage and then later regret having helped at all. Thomas Young's work was well known, uh, not only in England, but also in other countries. What's more, he sent copies of his work to various scholars up and down the continent, and particularly to Paris. And copies of Young's work were sent to Sylvestre de Sassy. One day, de Sassy showed a copy of Young's work to a young Frenchman. And the name of the Frenchman was Jean-Francois Champollion. Jean-Francois Champollion's destiny seemed tied to the Rosetta Stone from birth. French legend describes how his bedridden mother was visited by a sorcerer months before Jean-Francois was born. Looking into the eyes of this sickly woman, the sorcerer saw the past being connected with the future. He predicted this woman's unborn son would be the one to bring light onto the centuries of the past. Champollion was born in Figeac, France, 1790, to a small town bookseller. When he was 11, and living in a boarding school in Grenoble, news of Napoleon's expedition to Egypt captured the imagination of France. Champollion's older brother, Jacques Joseph, read tales of Egypt's glories and mysteries to his younger brother. When the younger Champollion received a copy of the Rosetta Stone from a cousin who had traveled to Egypt as part of the expedition, he was hooked. Young Jean-Francois made it his goal to read the hieroglyphs, and that of course meant cracking the Rosetta Stone. All his early training was devoted with that in mind. He soon paid little attention to his other studies. Languages were his all-consuming obsession. His studies became focused on Oriental and Middle Eastern languages, especially Coptic. Coptic had been a language spoken by Christians in Egypt and written in Greek. When he was about 14, Champollion uh, was working far too hard, uh, not on his schoolwork, but on Egyptian hieroglyphics. And he had what nowadays I think would be called a, a minor nervous breakdown. And he was sent off to recover. And he wrote a letter back to his elder brother saying, it's so boring here, send me a Chinese grammar. That was the kind of obsessive personality that Champollion was. Champollion's early studies focused on the deciphering of the demonic language and its relation to Coptic. He had previously believed that hieroglyphs were symbolic, that they were mysterious and could not be deciphered in an ordinary way. But at about the same time as Young, Champollion began to sense the same links between the Greek names and the hieroglyphic cartouches. When reports of Thomas Young's work reached him, Champollion realized in a flash they were correct. Champollion would take Young's work and propel it forward. After obtaining an inscription of the known cartouche of Cleopatra from the Temple of Philae, Champollion recognized that if Ptolemy and Cleopatra have common letters, their hieroglyphs should have similar signs as well. 
When Champollion lined up their hieroglyphic names, the signs for P, L, and O lined up. Champollion had proven Young's theory that foreign names were spelled phonetically in the hieroglyphic language. The door was now open, and Champollion was about to walk through. Champollion realized that Young was right, that you could show that hieroglyphs could write the names of the Greek rulers of Egypt. But that was one thing. It may be that that was simply a way used in later times to write foreign names. The question was whether hieroglyphs went back in the same way into earlier periods. Champollion took a look at a copy of an inscription from the Great Temple of Karnak. This inscription had a king's name repeating itself many times. The king's name was written with three signs. At the top was a sun disk. Champollion knew from Coptic that the name of the sun in ancient Egyptian was pronounced Ra. At the bottom was a letter that Thomas Young had identified, the letter S. It was written twice. What he now had was the name of a king that began with Ra and ended with S. The middle sign was a tricky one. It had not been deciphered by Young or anyone else, but Champollion traced that sign in the Rosetta Stone. It occurred several times. Whenever it occurred, the corresponding Greek translated into the idea of birth or being born. Champollion knew the Coptic for to give birth was Mise. So there he had a king's name, beginning with Ra. The middle is Mise, and the end is S. And Champollion knew the ancient names of the kings of Egypt, and he knew that there had been a famous king on the throne of Egypt called Ra Messi. And suddenly, he realized he was looking at the key to the whole thing. The knowledge of Coptic, the alphabet deciphered by Thomas Young, plus his immense knowledge of ancient Egypt, gave one the decisive breakthrough. And at this point, he comes up with, Je tiens l'affaire, I've got it. Young's reaction to Champollion's efforts were mixed. He was happy to see someone moving along his work, but he was enraged by Champollion's refusal to give him any credit. Champollion may have had the same ideas, but his work was not published. Young's was. When Champollion finally did publish his results, he became the talk of Paris. All of France celebrated the fact that a Frenchman had deciphered the hieroglyphs first. But Champollion couldn't be bothered with such controversy. His tremendous work ethic only grew as his efforts continued with astounding tenacity and speed. He was now determined to compile a complete list of all pharaohs and the dates they held power. By 1824, Champollion had built a hieroglyphic alphabet containing 21 letters. All of Champollion's work was done sitting behind a desk, using copies of inscriptions others had provided. What would happen when he traveled to Egypt and looked at the hieroglyphs firsthand? Could he really make the hieroglyphs speak? What would they finally say? The door was beginning to open into Egypt's past. The Rosetta Stone was finally proving to be the key to unlocking the hieroglyphs. But what did they say? What secrets and mysteries would be revealed? The announcement of Jean-Francois Champollion's discovery brought him much acclaim in France. The French Academy had previously considered him a crazy obsessive, working away in his room and getting nowhere. But now, suddenly, he was a national hero. The French government asked Champollion to arrange the purchase of British Egyptologist Henry Salt's extensive collection. After its incorporation into the Louvre Museum in 1827, Champollion was appointed the museum's first curator of Egyptian antiquities. However, Champollion had more in his mind than building the museum's inventory. He wanted to travel to Egypt. In 1828, with help from the Museum of Turin in Italy, Champollion organized an expedition to travel up the Nile River. This was the largest scientific effort to Egypt since Napoleon. 
It was his first exposure and an absolute stunning exposure to the monuments of Egypt. And of course, he ran around them like a wild thing, identifying cartouches. This is what was one thing that was obsessing them at the time, trying to establish the dates of monuments and the order of kings, because they had no true framework for Egyptian history that they could base on the evidence from the monuments. Napoleon's trip proved beyond a doubt his methods were accurate. He was able to read the ancient Egyptians' language off the temple walls themselves. His efforts in translating the hieroglyphs are credited with single-handedly creating the science of Egyptology. Egypt was no longer the land of silence. It was now speaking to us from the past. The names of pharaohs such as Ramesses and Tutmosis were legendary, but now their faces could be identified. We now knew when they ruled and in which temples they prayed. Upon returning to Paris, Champollion continued his work. He now had enough material to write the definitive history of Egypt. Unfortunately, he would never get the chance. On March 4th, 1832, Jean-Francois Champollion died. Champollion never had any doubts about his own ability and about his own achievement. And although he died at the age of 42, towards the end of his life, it was realised what he had done. And the French, quite rightly, created a professorship of Egyptology for him, the first anywhere in the world. So he died knowing that his achievement had been recognised. A lot of Champollion's work was left after his death, and the elder brother collected it, published it as a memorial to the genius in the family. Where Champollion had focused on the pharaonic history of Egypt, others began to use his tools to study the demonic and hieroglyphic languages. The amount of written material on walls and on papyrus scrolls was tremendous. As the years went by, the social, political, economic history of the ancient Egyptians began to be understood. But it was the personal written records that surprised most people. We learned that by looking at the ancient Egyptians, we were looking at ourselves. Slowly, it became clear that the Egyptians were like the rest of us. Uh, they wrote letters to the bank manager. They wrote um, letters to the local tax official. They wrote letters to each other um, about various normal aspects of normal lives. They had literature, just like ours, not very different. The Rosetta Stone brought back to life the history of both ancient Egypt and of mankind itself. Although the Rosetta Stone has been deciphered now for more than 170 years, we're still only scratching the surface of what mysteries are buried. From the spectacular treasures found in the tomb of King Tutankhamun in 1922, to the uncovering of the tomb of the sons of Ramesses the Great in 1995, ancient Egypt is still providing new and amazing discoveries. The Rosetta Stone is a milestone between a period when all we knew about our own origins was in the Bible or in the writings of the Greeks and the Romans. After the Rosetta Stone, we start to look at ancient history speaking for itself. It starts to say, where have we come from? Where have the ideas come from? What are our roots? And the Rosetta Stone is a way of bringing us face to face with our own identity. And now, through the extraordinary efforts of men like Napoleon Bonaparte, Thomas Young, and Jean-Francois Champollion, the riddle of the Rosetta Stone has been solved. The language and mysteries of the ancient Egyptians can now be understood. <laughs>